Welcome to Let's Play Rule the Waves 3 as Germany starting in 1935. It's 1947 and we've just started a major war with Britain and had a major battle and had a board of inquiry, which was so much fun. Thank you to everybody who took part in that. That was an absolute hoot and really interesting deep dive into the idea of reputation, prestige, great admiral, winning, and all of that kind of stuff. We are now going to move into the more practical applications of the consequence of that battle and get some fleet organization going because all of the various elements of the fleets did not work quite in harmony as I'd hoped and didn't get picked up by the battle generator as I'd hoped. But before we get into that, let's have a quick look at the previous year. So quite modest on the design side, just a bunch of uh, very needed wartime corvettes for minesweeping and a new medium bomber. A lot of the previous year was taken up by design started the year before that in 45 coming to fruition. So we have built 12 corvettes. We've got another, a third carrier rebuilt to take jets. We have uh, one heavy cruiser and three light cruisers extensively refitted with a major anti-air refit, none for all the rest, and of course, war with Britain, and probably with France. I say probably with France, almost certainly with France. I expect the next turn or the turn after, France will join into the war. I, I you know, as an ally of Britain, I can't see them stepping aside. Finance has done fine, but actually that's a slight exaggeration because this 558 is wartime finance. But, you know, it's a big jump from what it was at the start of the year. The funds, because our expensive has radically increased with the war, has gone down slightly. We've been doing more construction, primarily refits, and the number of techs again, has been relatively modest. You know, uh, it was last year the same, but for the previous three years, it was much higher, double uh, in some instances. We currently have no allies. That could change because we are at war with Britain and um, Japan is at war with Britain. I could imagine Japan coming in to help us or formalize an agreement between the two of us. And because of that, if you have a look here on the Italy row, Italy are also an ally of Japan, so it could be sort of a daisy chain reaction where one joins another and another. So it could turn into a bit of a nasty mini world war. Obviously, the crucial one will be relations with America. So currently, we are at number three. They are only two against the Japanese. They're five against the Italians. Hmm. Okay. And with the British and the French, they're at zero. So they're not going to come into our side. So I guess the um, the main thing is making sure they don't come into their side. So that's 46 in review. Let's have a little look at our considerable list of things to reorganize. So first of all, I need to change the size of dive bomber and torpedo squadrons, particularly whilst I don't have close control over their missions, to make them more flexible and to let them access guided missiles more easily. I need to replace my fighters with jet fighters. I don't know, uh, do I just replace all of my fighters? I mean, that's quite a long-term program. Do I have like an interim fighter that still equips some of the turboprop fighters? fighters before I get a chance to um, get rid of everybody. I need to separate the carriers into two divisions because the battle generator doesn't seem to be happy with one whopping great big carrier division. I need to focus the heavy cruisers on supporting the battle cruisers and the light cruisers on screening the carriers. I think the heavy cruisers have um, more to do, their guns will be bigger help with battle cruisers than hanging around the uh, carriers. I need to do some refits on some of the ships that are currently under repair. I need to start building coastal submarines. 
four at a time. I turned it off a few months ago because I felt the submarine force was getting too big and too expensive specifically. But now that we're at war and, and losing a shed load of submarines, I need to turn that back on again. And I also need to redeploy and refactor the submarine campaign because that first month was absolutely dreadful. And I've had a little bit of analysis of that. So this is the losses of the first month. I'm noticing the Corvette Robert Brown here sinking two submarines. <laughs> Crikey. Yeah, that was really painful. And I did a little bit of analysis of the kinds of stats involved. So first of all, on the success side of things, we've got a pretty decent ASW force with our surface ships and our air uh, that are on trade protection. We are facing 25 Royal Navy submarines, uh, and we sank one of them, which is 4% of all British submarines. On the negative side, we had 109 U-boats. We sank 16 transports for the cost of 13 submarines. That's 12% of all operational U-boats. Now, if that carries on, that will just simply, I mean, there's nothing to do. That will just decimate the entire force. I would like to think that the game is replicating a common pattern which is that at the start of the war, submarine losses in the first month or two can be very high as the brutal realities of war wheel out weaker submarines, weaker captains, or unlucky captains who get caught by intelligence that the other side has and all of that kind of stuff. So our ratio, 1.23 transports lost for every U-boat loss is absolutely a and I thought to myself, well, you know, is this just going to carry on? So I had a couple of experiments set up. First of all, I have varied it by where the submarines are deployed. Are they concentrated only in Northern Europe or are they spread out into adjacencies as well? And secondly, are they following prize rules? or are they following unrestricted warfare? So here is the results of all the submarines being concentrated in Northern Europe, following prize rules over the five months period. Here's the first month that we actually have already suffered. And then here is February, March, April, and May. And you can see, Across the course of these months, the losses were a lot less. There was still a bad month here, but 30 U-boats were sunk. In the same time, the Royal Navy also had a bad month with five. Given that they are a quarter the size, if you multiply that by four, that would be the same as losing 20. And they've lost 11. And then here you can see the totals lost of British transport ships. So from that initial 16, it has gone up for a couple of months and then down for a bit. Again, this bad month showing and really pushing down the figures. So for a total of 87, which gives us a figure of 2.9 transports sunk for every U-boat lost, which I think is, you know, not far off historical, you know, on average, certainly in the Second World War. Obviously, in the happy times, that was a very different figure. But later on, when Allied ASW forces were all over the U-boats, um, that figure went way down. They also lost the liner, you know, with the neutrals being outraged and stuff like that, even though it was on prize rules. So that, that varies a bit. And the Germans here, we lost one, sorry, we lost 0.68 U-boats per Royal Navy submarine lost after you adjust it for the fact that the Royal Navy is a quarter the size. And 2.9, it's not breathtaking, I'm going to say. Here is what happens if you still concentrate in Northern Europe, but you move to unrestricted warfare. Obviously, the first month's exactly the same. And then the losses are pretty comparable. There's Again, there's a bad month here. The Royal Navy, again, loses a comparable number of submarines, 
I assume, because they're blockading us, that their profile is on fleet support. And the losses from British transports was substantially more. Not breathtakingly more, not double or anything, but something in the region of 40% more. So you know, a little short of half as much again. So 3.75 transports per U-boat loss seems a bit of a healthier um, response, but nothing to, you know, actually make you go, wow. So two liners lost, negative opinions, and 0 0.82 U-boats lost per Royal Navy submarine loss. So clearly, at the risk of the additional liners, unrestricted warfare does give substantially better results, better return on investment for your U-boats. The second set of experiments, again over the same five months, was to redeploy the U-boat force. So currently, we have 64 coastal U-boats who have to stay in Northern Europe. I mean, some could go to the Baltic, but I don't think there's any particular reason to put them there. And we have 36 submarines that can be deployed to North America, the Caribbean, West Africa, and the Mediterranean. So my plan is to push them out pretty equally, 10, 10, 10, and, and six into West Africa, and see how that changes things. Now, I've had a chat with uh, Laxon, uh, also known as Saxon, also known as Bragon, uh, if you see him on the forums. And he talked about this kind of idealized deployment for future reference. So I probably should have had some coastal submarines pre-deployed into the Mediterranean because I can't get there now because we're at war. Um, some in the Baltic, although given the Soviet Union is there, it's hard to know how many ships, uh, merchant ships are sunk per region, so it's hard to know exactly where you only get the aggregate figure. Obviously, put most of your coastal submarines in Western Europe. He suggested having a few minesweeping submarines and move them to wherever ASW was low, um, because they give you considerable flexibility. And although you can't tell how much transports you're sinking in these various regions, you can tell, I think, um, what the ASW is, or at least how many escorts are in these regions. So you might want to shuffle some of these. And then to have a couple of long-range submarines going to uh, the west coast of America, if they can get through the Suez Canal, can they? I'm not sure. Certainly to South America, coast, uh, east coast, to southern Africa, uh, and it, potentially if you could get there into the Indian Ocean as well, and really spread out the resources. So that's, uh, that's a sort of an interesting ideal to consider yeah, for the future. My experiment into dispersing my U-boats to the east coast of America, to the Caribbean, to Western Africa, and to the Med, produced these figures when being on prize rules. So the number of U-boats lost pretty much stayed the same. The, the British in this run was uh, a bit better than usual. Usually they'd be 10, 11. They're only down to seven here. And the number of transports lost was actually uh, less, frankly. Now, Obviously, I've only conducted four experiments, and those experiments only went over five months, one of which was real data, four of which were uh, estimated data. So it's potentially within experimental error that this is a bit of an outlier. So only 2.2 transports lost per U-boat, and also, interestingly, three liners lost, despite being on prize rules. How weird is that? And then I went to unrestricted warfare, and here 
This equally could be a bit of an outlier because this is a really good month. So the number of U-boats went down to 25, which is less than usual. And the British lost nine, which is slightly less, but in the region, nine, 10, 11, that seems fine. But obviously the number of transports lost rocketed up. So despite again, you've got this bad month here, relatively bad, but it's still much better than some of the other bad months. So normally you're losing two or three and getting around about 50, except here we're getting 35. Here you lose five and you, uh, we only got 28. Still, that gave us 179 transports lost, which is 7.2 transports per U-boat. So double uh, the, or more than double, the best of the other things. So using unrestricted warfare and having a dispersed deployment would, on the basis of these experiments, appear to be the optimal play for your uh, submarine force once you have a substantial submarine force. So uh, and if we just, oh, before I move on to the next one, I had a little look for this one of how things were deployed in turn one and how things were deployed by turn five. And what's interesting here is that in Northern Europe, the number of submarines has increased. That's because I've only been building coastal submarines, so they've all had to go to Northern Europe. Uh, West Africa hasn't lost any. The Caribbean has only lost two. The American East Coast has only lost two. And the Med has only, uh, hasn't lost any. And we've had 24 new submarines. So the bulk of the losses have been in Northern Europe. And I'm pretty sure that the reason for that is, is that the ASW forces outside of Northern Europe are relatively modest and they're quite intense in Northern Europe. So the medium submarines, the SSs, actually seem like a pretty good investment at this point. Yes, the coastal submarines are as cheap as chips, well, relatively, half the price, but they have died in substantial numbers, but producing four has been able to keep that figure pretty buoyant. Um, so actually four submarines a shot is a pretty good number, it would seem, from this. But getting that pattern into actual submarines would be better, except the little factor of building a fleet of SSs only would be much more expensive than what I was already feeling to be quite an expensive investment. So I thought that was, that was really interesting. And then finally, just to sort of summarize that, here's our U-boat losses against whether they were concentrated and doing prize rules or dispersed using prize rules or concentrated doing unrestricted or dispersed doing unrestricted U-boat warfare. So a clear advantage, not vast, but nonetheless a clear advantage in losses using unrestricted warfare. Secondly, the number of transports lost. So concentrated using prize rules, concentrated, sorry, dispersed using prize rules, and then concentrated using unrestricted and dispersed using unrestricted. So unrestricted warfare lowers your U-boat losses and substantially increases your merchant ship losses. So for me, the results of these experiments are unrestricted is much better for your U-boat survivability rate. Unrestricted is much better for sinking transports and medium submarines, your SSs, are more survivable if they're dispersed than concentrating your coastal submarines. So yeah, really interesting. I'm going to conduct a lot of those reorganizations from this list, but almost all of it is admin. So I'll spare you 
uh, watching me fiddle around with uh, redeploying things and come back and report on what I've done against these reorganizations in the next episode. So thanks very much for watching. Come and join me for when this is all done. And of course, having done it, when we get into the next battle as a chastened admiral who's completely learned his lessons and it's all going to be fine, honestly. <laughs> Thanks, and bye-bye for now.